My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Also with me today is Tanya Fincham. And today is May 3rd, 2011. We're in Delaware County, Oklahoma, interviewing David and Gayla Holcomb, uh, part of the Holcomb Farm. And this is an oral history interview, part of the Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate having you here. Well, we want to begin by learning a little bit more about your family. How did your family come to Oklahoma? Why don't you start that off? Uh, they came on the Trail of Tears in 1836 or 1837. Uh, the original Johnson Thompson uh, only lived like two years, and but he was already married and had children. And then that's how uh, the property came into being through that lineage. And do you know how he chose this land? No, I do not. There was a, a rather large group of brothers that came together, and uh, one of his brothers, uh, they have a centennial farm adjoining ours. So it was a family enterprise. They, they all came together. Okay. So. And when he first came, do you know the original acreage? We're assuming from everything that we can tell based on Indian allotments and the Trail of Tears information, probably was in the neighborhood of 60 acres to begin with. And, and where did they come from? Georgia, somewhere in Georgia. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Johnson Thompson, that is your great, great, great grandfather. Father. Okay. So then, who came next? Who the farm was passed down to who? To his son, James Franklin Thompson. Okay. And he also fought in the Civil War. And then he came back home after the war uh, with his wife and helped his mother farm. Uh, he was not there very long. He was killed in an accident on the farm. So uh, then from there, it passed down to his daughter. And uh, it's been the daughter lineage ever since until... Him. <laughs> it's a very interesting take. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> well, on those those early uh, days of the farm, uh, any stories of um, early crops, livestock that they were raising? What I can remember, you know, dating clear back to say childhood days, <clears throat> everything was extremely versified. And Mama had her little house of chickens that had twenty five to fifty laying hens in it and of course in the outside there was a hog lot that you had your butcher holes in and you had four or five milk cows that we milked and used that for home use and anything that was excess you'd take it to town and trade it for feed or edible products for the home. On the farming side of it uh, here again small acreages of wheat, oats, barley had some corn crops, uh, had a few beef cows, and like I said, it was just an extremely diversified farming operation. But it took that to sustain the family. And then early structures at that time. Okay, of course, there was an older house there before I was born, but then the house that my mother lived in and was raised in, they built when she was in her teenage years. There was two older structures. Most people would look at them as barns. We called one of them a granary, one of them was called a barn. Uh, her, her brother and her sister and her mother and dad lived in the loft of one of the barns while they were building the house that she continued to live in. And then of course, after she got married, her and my dad lived in this particular house and that's where I was born and raised. And that structure and these two barns are still on the place today. Do you, were you uh, do you have memories of your great grandmother or grandmother? Oh, grandmother and granddad, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 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 not grandmother. Not no, I don't have any memories of the grandmother. She was already gone, but my granddad passed away when I was six years old. Okay. But yeah, I have fond memories of him. Okay. Yeah. And uh, was he a farmer? Did he always work on the farm? Yes, he was a full-time farmer. Okay. He was raised right there on the farm, and that's all I ever knew him doing was farming, and of course, handed it down to my uncle and 
my mother, of course, they had a sister, but she wasn't in the picture. She had moved to Perkins, Oklahoma. Okay. So as a as a little boy, you're growing up on the farm. Yes. What's life like on the farm for you? Oh, I was free to roam. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have you chores? Bet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was my chore was to milk the cows and feed the hogs. Mama always took care of the chickens. Part of the time, she'd send me to the hen house to gather eggs. And, oh, I'll never forget one of those occasions out there in the middle of the summer. Reached in there to gather eggs, and it wasn't what it was supposed to be. And there was a big old black snake curled up <laughs> underneath that hen. And that was the end of my egg gathering. That was Mama's chore from then on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we all had our chores to do, and you know we didn't even realize it was work back then. And that's just that was just the style of life. You got up, you went, fed your cows, you did your milking, you did your chores, you come back in, you ate breakfast, and you got ready and went to school. And did you have brothers and sisters? I had one sister. She was two and a half years younger than me. Okay. So tell me about the farmhouse. Describe it for me. Oh, the farmhouse. Okay, it had a back porch on it, had a kitchen, dining room, and a fancy living room, or I thought it was fancy back in those days, three bedrooms, and uh, when they built it, they even built a bathroom in it. But naturally, there was no indoor plumbing, there was no electricity, everything was still done with a little Johnny house out back, and you had a well that you got your water from. But I think I was about six, maybe seven years old, somewhere along in that age when electricity came in. Gosh, I thought that was really neat. You get to go in there and flip a switch and there was a light come on. And then, of course, they plumbed the house and we had water in the house. And gosh, you got ready to go to bed at night. You didn't have to go down the trail to the outhouse. You just, everything was there in the house. So I felt like I was in a little mansion. But uh, looking back at it today, you know, it's pretty modest. But back then, I thought I was in tall cotton because we had we had everything that we needed. Had a big old wood stove in the living room. And winter time, everybody stayed warm. Brought your wood in, built a big fire. And you got ready to go to bed, and I know this don't sound very good, but you shucked your clothes right behind the stove and made a beeline for the bed and jumped in, and you never wiggled. <laughs> you stayed right there till the next morning when you'd hear Mama get up. Get the fire going, and you jump out of bed and run and retrieve your clothes because they were warm then. <laughs> what what part of the house was your bedroom in? Well, our three bedrooms were on the east side of the house, and my bedroom was the, what would have been the southeast corner of the house. Okay. It was down the hall away from the kitchen. Of course, there was a bathroom in between the kitchen and my bedroom, and then you walked into the next room with a living room, and that's where the stove was. And that was kind of the center of activity in the winter time. Summertime, naturally, the kitchen was a center of activity. That's where we spent most of our time if we were in the house. So where would you take your bath? <laughs> On the back porch in the washing machine when Mama got through washing. <laughs> 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 yeah, I can remember many, many times that my sister and I, you know, you'd bring the water in and you had your wash tubs and the no ringer washing machine. And when you got through washing the clothes, well, then she'd throw Carol and I in the tub and we'd play and just, I mean, we thought we were in tall cotton because we had free water. We just played and played and played. That was, that was the uh, Saturday night bath right there. Mm -hmm. So, so you guys went in all in the same time. You know, you you didn't go last because you were the boy. Oh, that didn't make any didn't difference. Didn't make a difference. No, no. There wasn't a pecking order. No. Uh, okay. No, there never was a pecking order between her and I. Uh, we did everything together. <laughs> uh. Well, tell me about mealtime. What was mealtime like? I know what it was like after we got married and what Sunday dinners was well, like in her house. Sunday dinners for you. They, those were really special because uh, she'd go out in the backyard and wring the neck of the chicken and uh, bring it in and dress it, and you'd have fried chicken after church, and there's just nothing any better than, you know, fresh, fresh, fresh stuff. But it was cooked in a black skillet, too. Yeah, it was cooked mm. in a black skillet. That's made made fried chicken good. <laughs> Would she have a, uh, a, a, everybody seems to have their own technique when it comes to slaughtering the chicken. Did she have a technique? 
And she grabbed him by the neck and ring him about four or five times and the neck separated from the body and when it quit flopping, she picked the chicken up and stick him in hot water and plucked the feathers off. And she wouldn't make you pluck anything? No, Mama did all of that. She, was, she didn't have time to fool with us. She mm -hmm. was too quick. <laughs> we were too slow. She wanted things done and she'd take care of it. Okay. Of course, she would take the entrails out of the chicken and clean it and take it to the house and cut it up. And like more I said, you know, got the skillet out and fried that chicken. Now, what Mama was really famous for was those angel food cakes. Yes. Now, she could take a dozen eggs and whip up the best angel food cake you have ever eaten in your life. They just don't make them anymore. Mm -hmm. You just can't find one like she used to cook. Because everybody probably thinks that about their mom. Did she have a big garden? Oh, yeah. So lots of canning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mama had a huge garden. And, uh, of course, we all worked in the garden. We enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. But, yeah, she would can and can and can and can and freeze stuff later on in life. But earlier, she canned everything. Of course, we had a cellar in the backyard. She stored all of her canned goods in the cellar. Then the next winter, we'll, we'd make hay day on them. Growing up early on without electricity, did you have an icebox, an ice man come by? I was too young, I don't even remember. Okay. They had a nice wagon up here, or a nice house in Maysville. And I do remember we'd go up there once in a while and get chunks of ice. But my recollection of most of that, and they probably did have ice for the ice box. I mean, I'm sure that's right. But my recollection of the ice was bringing it home in a gunny sack and beating it up with a ball peen hammer or a sledgehammer and then having homemade ice cream. Mm. So that's that's what sunk in my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trip to the ice house and the homemade ice cream. Would you have to churn it? Oh, you bet. It was fun. <laughs> but I knew what the end result was going to be. <laughs> Didn't mind that at all. <laughs> my arm would get tired, I think. Oh, yeah. But, you know, still, you knew the end result. It was going to be good. <laughs> Mama was real good at breakfast. I mean, she loved to fix a hot breakfast for you. She thought that was the, the meal of the day. And it was always, you know, fried eggs and bacon and homemade biscuits, and they were homemade. I mean, there was none of this town bought stuff. And of course, I remember her talking coffee. Of course, I wasn't quite old enough to drink coffee at that time, but when instant coffee came around, that was just Katie bar the door. That was the worst thing that had ever been invented. It was nasty. It, it was just not like homemade coffee. And of course, she had the old percolator type coffee pot mm -hmm. back then. If you were late getting to the coffee, I can remember the older guys getting the grinds and complaining about, you know, didn't get there quick enough to get the original good coffee. <laughs> so how early did, did your dad start working on a, any given day? My dad never did work on the farm much. Really? <clears throat> no. He was a carpenter. Okay. And he worked away from the farm. My mother and my brother put a railway in the farm you until... your uncle. Yeah, my brother and my uncle did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uncle pretty well did the farm work. Okay. Until after I got out of college. Hmm. Of course, I helped him a lot. But yeah, Dad always worked out various places around the area doing carpentry work, painting and hanging wallpaper and construction type like that. But he just never did have much interest in the farm. Okay. His job would keep keep him away from home. He would go and you know stay like for a week because you couldn't afford to drive back and forth. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't an option. So when he had jobs like in Grove or Miami or something like that, he would go in and stay. So he really wasn't wasn't there a lot. Okay. So your uncle probably passed down a, a lot of tips and tricks when it comes to farm work? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I just idolized him. I mean, you know, I was small and influential, and he was the man role that was around the house most of the time. And of course, he was out doing the farm work, and that's what I enjoyed was the animals and following the team of mules and picking corn and doing the things on the farm. I mean, that was just a golden life for a young boy. And uh, traipsed after him, well, until he passed away. Hmm. But learned a lot from him. Well, what was his name? Garland. Okay. Garland left Barry. Okay. Um, and what were the mules' names? <laughs> Oh, I don't have any idea. <laughs> Sometimes it wasn't nice. <laughs> Whether they was obeying him or not. <laughs> now, where did you go to school growing up? 
Okay, I went to four years right up here in a little country school called Jurgen. That was my first four years. And then we, because mother was a school teacher also, she had a job in Jay teaching grade school there. So we transferred, my sister and I transferred into Jay, and we spent the rest of our years there until we graduated from high school. Hmm. But Jurgen was like two miles from our home. And how would you get there? Well, most of the time we walked. Once in a while, a neighbor would come by and I'd get to ride his bicycle with him. But then in the wintertime, we'd hitch a ride on the school bus. Jay ran a school bus for the high school kids because this was just a grade school from one to eight. So they ran a bus out here and they'd let us get on the bus and ride to Jurgen and then they'd dump us off and pick us up that afternoon and bring us back home. But if it was warm weather or nice weather, we either walked or rode our bicycles. And what would you bring for lunch? Oh, we were fortunate. We had a cook shack at school and had a lady that uh, prepared the lunches for us. And of course, if we'd come in every morning, you could smell that homemade bread. <laughs> Still smell it. But they prepared lunches for us. We didn't have to carry our own. Hmm. Okay. And then when you started going to school in Jay, how did you get there? Well, since mother was teaching, she drove. So we rode with her every day. But once in a while, she'd have to stay for a teacher's meeting, and we thought it was an absolute treat to get the ride to school bus home. <laughs> well, no other kid thought that. I mean, they said, you know, I've got to ride the school bus, and they hated it. My sister and I thought it was fantastic because it was something new, something we hadn't got to do very often. But yeah, normally we rode back and forth with our mother. And you probably had to be good in school. Well, I won't say that. <laughs> but I'll say one thing. She found out about it faster than anybody. It wasn't humanly possible for her to know what we did, but she did. But yeah, teachers' kids, they get ratted on instantly. Same thing happened to our children whenever he taught. Well, <laughs> true. So, you know. <laughs> no, I wasn't an angel. What goes around comes around. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was no angel in school. You got into mischief? Come on. My share. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? You don't want to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything but study. <laughs> Studying wasn't my game. Now, now your mother was born on the homestead? Yes, she was born in not the house that's there today, but in the original house that was on the homestead. She was born there. Okay. And where did she go to school? Her grade school work was here at Emmanuel. And I... Well, yeah, then she went to Southwest and City and finished South high City. school, and she mm -hmm. did her high school work at Southwest City before you all went far away. <laughs> <laughs> and then she went to college for a while up in Missouri, didn't she? Mm -hmm. For a short period for of time. For a short period of time, and then finished up her, her teaching credentials at Tahlequah, didn't she? Yeah. But she also went to the Indian Seminary there in Tahlequah for a little while. Did she? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. For a short time. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I guess education was important to her? Oh, yeah. Very important. Yeah, she got her, I couldn't tell you what year, she graduated from high school, and then she went ahead and got her four-year college degree, bachelor's degree, and then while she was teaching, drove back and forth in the summertime to Tahlequah from here to get her master's degree. But she only devoted 42 years to teaching. <laughs> but, yeah, she was very dedicated to education. Hmm. Sure was. His grandmother, the lady that's in that picture right over there, uh, she went to the Cherokee Seminary at Tahlequah also. So it comes from a long line of, of teachers and in the Bibles and stuff that we have found uh, after his mother passed and we started cleaning things away. There was like four or five generations worth of Bibles and a lot of the Bible said Sunday school teachers edition. So I'm thinking that there, you know, there was a lot of Sunday school taught by the relatives also. So it's just uh, something that is in the in the genes. Hmm. Well, it's just like the Emmanuel Baptist Church up here. Granddad was one of the original ones. Charter that members. Helped mm -hmm. build that church with the lumber from right here in the area. And like she said, was a charter member. Of course, Mom was the secretary of the church, uh, as far as I know, from the day she was born till she died. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed like forever. Yeah. Well, when you were going to the to the one room school. Uh huh. Jurgen. You probably had uh, school programs, Christmas programs. Mm -hmm. What were those like? Had pie suppers and Christmas programs, and we'd have a Valentine party once a year. 
they'd have a uh, pie auction and a pie supper to raise funds for the Christmas party. Well, then the Christmas party, of course, naturally, Santa Claus had to show up. But because we were grades one through eight, the older kids would put on a little play. The younger kids, we kind of got to sit back and watch everything, but we really didn't care because we knew that they'd had a good pie supper and Santa Claus was going to bring us a toy. <laughs> and, of course, if we'd got a toy, we were tickled to death. It wasn't that you're going to get Nintendo games and TV games and Power Ranger games. <laughs> you got one toy, and you were tickled to death. But yep, Christmas program was big. But what was it like when you saw Santa Claus come through that door? Oh. <laughs> it was a highlight of the day. <laughs> so, ooh, here it is. We get our toy now. We've heard some stories as, as the kids get older, they realize they know who Santa Claus is, and it kind of spoils it for them. Like, hey, wait a second. That looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, you bet. <clears throat> um, so your mother was Aileen? Aileen. Aileen Hogan. Okay. And your grandmother was Carrie B. Freeman Bard? Or Baird. 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 Uh, and then your great-grandmother was Lula Freeman. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure we got that down. You've probably got it down better yeah. than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting that both of your parents worked outside of the farm, other jobs, you know, and then still uh -huh. had the land. Mm -hmm. uh, was that tough on your mom to juggle? Well, like I said, the majority of the heavy farm work was done by my uncle. Okay. Uh, mother stayed on the home place, and the reason what really got this role and start with was while my granddad was still alive, right there at the end, he got to be pretty invalid, and naturally had to have somebody take care of him. Well, Mama felt like it was her responsibility, so she stayed in that home, and she took care of him at the same time that she was married to my dad, and of course, raising Carol and I, and our uncle moved up the road Oh, it's about a mile to another house. But he went ahead and took care of the farm work. And then I got to help him do the farm part of it. So yeah, Mama had the chickens and then she'd help some with the milk cows and some with the chores. But yeah, her, her primary job was school teaching and gardening and cooking and the homemaking mm -hmm. type stuff. But as far as going out and doing the field work, she never did help us with that a lot. Okay. Well, as you're growing up, did the crops and livestock pretty pretty much stay the same, or did it change as you started getting older? Oh, from as early as I was involved with it until at least after high school, the type of farming operation probably didn't change much. I mean, it was started out, like I said, there was a couple of mules and a team, and everything was pretty well done by hand. And then about the time, I was trying to think here, I must have been probably 10, 11 years old, my uncle bought a tractor, a WD-45 Alice, and boy, <laughs> life changed. We thought we were in tall cotton for sure. I mean, you didn't have to walk behind that team. You didn't have to go harness up that team. And everything was done with the tractor, and it was two-row farming, and gosh, I mean, we thought we were getting along fantastic. Compared to today, huh, it would be antiquish. But uh, then, of course, once I graduated from high school, I went off to college, and I didn't come back and help much except during the summertime, and oh, I'd help a little bit on the weekends, but didn't do too much. Well, do you remember the first time you rode a tractor? Oh, you bet. What was that like? Oh, it was nice. How old were you? Oh, 10 or 11. But yeah, I made a hand on that tractor in a hurry because it was a lot more fun on that tractor than it was behind those mules. <laughs> the original allotment was 70 acres, and at that time, yeah, 60, 60 acres. Uh, at that time, how many acres did the family have? Still the 70, 60? Mm -hmm. Okay. And at any time, did they expand? Yes. Yes, okay. my uncle bought additional land. Oh, gosh. I'm trying to think in what year. I might have been 14, 15 when he bought an additional roughly 120, 25 acres probably. Okay. And expanded a little bit. Okay. And still the same livestock, crops? Yes, okay. same, same type practice. Okay. 
Um, now on the land, any conservation efforts, terracing, uh, ponds built? Back then, about the only conservation practices that was ever adhered to was construction of ponds. Because of the lay of our land being flat, <coughs> terraces wasn't an option or wasn't needed. So really about the only thing that he ever participated in was just constructions of ponds. Okay. And he did do four or five of those. But now that has changed drastically over the years. And so today, how many ponds are on the property? <laughs> Is that too many to count? <laughs> We've got a bunch of ponds, but we don't use many of them. We have completely, well not completely, but we still have access to our ponds. But We've changed our watering systems and fenced our ponds off and put in off-site watering systems and their accounts. And it's got its pluses and it's got its negatives, but uh, it's a lot better system than going to the ponds. I mean, ponds, you got cattle wading in there and you're causing erosion and you get run off and next thing you know, your ponds get built up, built up with silt and you have to clean them out every four or five years. And of course, when your ponds go dry, it's always during the middle of the summer when you don't have water anyway. So, you know, it's causing trouble. Then in the wintertime, your pond's ice over and you get cattle out on the pond. If you don't get enough holes cut, the next thing you know, they fall through the ice. So we have tried to fence most of our ponds off and put on the off-site watering systems. Works great unless electricity goes off. Mm -hmm. You better have a generator to back you up. <laughs> Modern technology has changed the operation. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and we're going to get to the farm today in a second, but you know, as you're as you're growing up and you're going through high school, are you thinking you want to work on a farm or do something else? Oh, I, <coughs> I think well, we haven't even alluded to this, but because my mother and dad divorced when I was in the fourth grade, they went their separate ways, and I ended up having to live with him in the summertime in Grove, or my sister and I both. And, you know, that's a city environment. We were country folks. And I guess that probably was the first thing that really got against me that, no, nope, I'm going back to the farm. I'm not going to be a city boy. I didn't like neighbors right next to me. You couldn't go out in the backyard and do your chores and, or your deeds. <laughs> and I just liked the rural life. So we eventually got to come back and stay here on the farm all the time. But no, I mean, there was nothing about the farm life but what I enjoyed. I mean, I enjoyed every bit of it. I'd get up and I'd have my little, of course, we had, once we got an FFA and 4-H and FFA, we had our show projects and had a pig and a cow. A little heifer was named Susie that, of course, she got nicknamed Susie by her folks, so we had quite a deal there when we first got <laughs> married. <laughs> and Susie died when we were in about the third year of college. It was like the death of a family member. Oh. It was not pretty for a few days because she had been such a good cow that she would raise her calf and usually another two or three besides oh, and then provide milk for the for the home and and cream and butter Allen would make butter and she would even have extra and she'd take her cream to town take her butter to town and, and trade it in for probably chicken feed for the chickens so uh, yeah Susie was it was a big deal when she passed <laughs> a big deal <laughs> well I was in seventh grade when a 4-H agent bought her for me and, uh, of course, I showed her. And then when she had her first calf, she gave, being a Holstein, she gave way too much milk for home use. So I'd go out and buy little baby calves at the sale barn. For back then, you'd buy them for $5. So that tells you how old it was. And she'd raise three to four at a time. Well, they'd get up to baby beef. And we'd take them to town and sell them. I'd go get me four more. Put on her. She'd raise them. And we'd do that two or three times through that cycle. Hmm. And then, like I say, she was very well attached to our family. Everybody just thought the world of her. And of course, at some point in time, you got to go on. Yeah. <laughs> she did her deal. But no, our daily daily life on the farm was a pleasure. Loved every moment of it. Never did desire to do anything different. When when you would go to town, you're, I'm assuming Jay? Southwest City. Southwest City. Okay. Southwest City. So if you're taking crops someplace or you're taking something someplace, Southwest City. That was our main center of attraction. Okay. That's where the feed store was. And like my wife said, I mean, that's where mama took the excess eggs and butter, milk, 
sold America Food Store, exchanged it for feed. Our bank was in Southwest City, so that's where they did all of their banking business and trading. And of course, there was two general stores up there, so that's naturally where they bought their groceries, and that was done once a week. I mean, you never went to town except on Saturday. It was just, that was a big event to get to go to town on Saturday, and everything that was needed was there in Southwest City. There was even a automobile dealership there, and that's where my uncle bought his pickup, and he would trade trucks, so he'd always trade there in Southwest City. But you'd go up there, and of course, we'd make an afternoon of it. Mom and them would go do their chores, and they had a park out there and the kids we'd all go do our thing and play and of course back then they had a big building up there and they'd have a drawing every Saturday afternoon at two o'clock where probably everybody in the community was there and they'd get up on top of this building and they'd holler out, Oh, I got ticket number so and so and this is so and so and you win this prize and when that was over with well, the town was vacant because everybody <laughs> went home. And then along about Thanksgiving and Christmas they'd always have a turkey drawing. And I know this is going to sound real cruel today. You wouldn't get away with it. But they'd throw live turkeys off the top of this building. And people would catch them. And if they caught them, they got to take them home. Well, sometimes there'd be a scuffle over who caught which turkey. <laughs> part of it went that way and part of it went that way. And one drumstick made it that way and one drumstick. <laughs> get my jest? <laughs> uh, but yeah, happy, happy memories, happy moments. It was a lot of fun. Well, you're in a, a unique place from a geography standpoint. I mean, you're so close to Arkansas. Yes. You're close to Missouri, and your property's in Oklahoma. Yes. So you mm -hmm. have several options when it comes to going to town. So. Well, we could make life miserable for a lot of folks because our mail was delivered to us out of the little town of Maysville, Arkansas. Our address would be Maysville, Arkansas. But like you say, we lived in Oklahoma, so our driver's license was out of Oklahoma. We did all of our banking and our business in Missouri. Shortly after we got married, we had moved out to this location here. She got stopped by the friendly highway patrolman. He had her so thoroughly confused. Which state do you live in? Where is your driver's license from? Your business is where? You do banking where? Your address is? And finally, he said, Ma'am, I don't care what you do, just get them all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I was still driving with my Arkansas driver's license, at, even though we had lived out here for quite some time, because I had such a fear of taking the test again, because I didn't do well on it whenever I was 16, taking it in Arkansas. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to push the envelope as far as I can. And I think we probably had Oklahoma tags on the car, and I was driving my Arkansas driver's license, and he just couldn't understand why things didn't match. There's reason for it. <laughs> yeah, you're you're in a very unique area from a geography standpoint. And then after I graduated from high school, of course, I wanted to go to college at Miami, N E L N M Junior College, and of course they had a J transcript from J Public Schools, you know, so they really knew that I was a resident of Oklahoma. But my address at that time was still Maysville, Arkansas, and oh, we had a terrible time at the dean's office trying to get that taken care of, but. I was not out of state, but I was an in-state student. I didn't want to pay out-of-state mm -hmm. tuition. But he finally decided, you know, I guess this is a legit deal. <laughs> what year did you graduate from high school? 65. Well, at that time, did you did you plan on majoring in an agricultural-related area? Yeah, I had finally maybe matured enough to realize that I wasn't going to be able to make a living on the farm immediately because of the other involvements that was already on the farm. And I knew I loved agriculture. I knew I loved education. So I chose Ag Ed to become an Ag teacher and went to school at, like I say, at Miami for two years. And then normal progression from Miami is to go to Stillwater. But that's 33 and a half hours from here. I needed to be on the farm with my mother because at that time my uncle was getting pretty aged and had emphysema and health was a big problem and we had gotten married and it was just going to be a lot more convenient to go to the University of Arkansas, which is 45 minutes from here. So we made that transition and we'd go over there and go to school and then come back home on weekends and 
help on the farm and kind of get things set up for the next week and then go back to school. And if we had to come home during the middle of the week, we could. So anyhow, I got my uh, bachelor's degree over there in 69 and started teaching. Back in this area? Well, we thought we knew it all. About 69, we were really smart. We just graduated from college. We had all the answers. We had a little boy, and we decided we just wanted to get completely away from everybody. So we, we took. We a, were weaned. Yeah, mm. yeah, we were weaned. <laughs> we took a job in southern Arkansas, mm. a little town called Blevins. It didn't take us long to want to come home. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. Uh, it was quite an experience. It was, but, a, it was the first year of integration, that will tell you a lot. Uh, and the ratio that the superintendent had presented to him about, you know, the white and black was misrepresented a little bit. And so when we got down there, it was, it was a challenge for him because he was smaller and younger looking than a lot of these big high school boys that were still going to school that, you know, Probably were old enough to be out, but we're still going to school. And it was, it was quite a challenge, it really was. Well, let me back that up just a little bit. When I got ready to go do my student teaching from the University of Arkansas, <clears throat> we had to draw our names out of the hat as to which school we went to because, you know, it, that's the only fair way of doing it. And the name I drew was uh, down in southern Arkansas. Well, here we are. We didn't have a dime to speak of. A little nine-month-old baby and one vehicle. So I just went in and told my advisor, I said, I'm going to have to drop out of school for a semester. So I just, I can't do this. There's no way it'll work. I just need a school right here close to home where we can drive back and forth. He said, nah, you're not going to drop out of school. Well, one of my buddies had drawn the school at uh, Mariana, Arkansas, which is just as far east as you can go. I mean, it's clear across the Bloom State. But like, there was a white school and a black school in that town, Lee County High School. He said, uh, if you want to go with your buddy, you can go over to the black school and he'll be at the white school. I had had no associations with blacks other than had one or two at the college in Miami that played basketball and they were fantastic. I thought, yeah, no problem, I'll do that. So we loaded up and that's where we went to do our student teaching. And like I say, I'm the little white boy in the black school. I had one of the best instructors to work with that I've ever been around. That nine weeks I spent over there was nothing but just perfect. I mean, those black kids were no different than the white kids. They had their same little problems. They'd pick on each other. They'd do their own little things. And, uh, I mean, it was great. So when I was offered this job down at Blevins and he was telling us what the ratio was, I said, that's no big deal. We're going to a black school. This is great. <laughs> Mixed them up that first year, it wasn't great. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there was tension. Oh, mm -hmm. big tension. Big tension. And, Turf you know, wars. <laughs> this group over here and this group over here and this group down here. And of course, I was a little bitty, tiny, small kid. and It, it wasn't a good environment. Mm -hmm. And then I had an opportunity to come back over here to Decatur, which is just 12 miles east of us. And uh, so that's what I did. Came back the next year, and that made me really close to home. And it was a good environment, good situation. And I stayed there until... They offered me this job over here at Jay, and I didn't want to go back and do it because that was my home school. And had too many teachers that were still teaching there that had me in class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really ready to go back and face this music yet, <laughs> but I did. And how long did you teach at Jay? Ten years until I retired, and I guess it was 89, 88. 88. 88. Yeah. Well, I want to back up for a second okay. um, and find out how you met your wife. Mm. Okay, that is a different story. At the creek. Well, no. <laughs> no, at, at Lowell's house. Well, uh, that was kind of the yeah. same deal. Uh, my sister had married his next door neighbor. Uh, she ran off and got married, eloped. And so my mother and dad, you know, they'd been married maybe a couple of months or something, decided it was time to come out and meet this other guy's folks. So we come out to, to meet... Uh, her in-laws, and had Sunday lunch with them. Well, David and his sister come up to play basketball with the the girl that lived there, Sandra. She was about your age. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we met. Uh, he was, you were a sophomore and I was a freshman in high school. 
So we was kind of sweet on each other for like one summer. And then he sent me a Dear John letter. Uh, it was too far for him to drive over there where I was at. He had just gotten his driver's license, just got a car. And I probably wasn't that interesting anyways. <laughs> We just, we just didn't ever have any more communication until I graduated from high school in 1966 and I sent him a graduation announcement. Uh, and then we started. Tell her the reason that you sent it. Because I, I figured he thought that I wouldn't have been able to make it through. So I went ahead and thought, I'm just going to show you. So I sent him the graduation announcement. And then from there on out, well, uh, we dated probably for another four or five months after I graduated from high school. The high school and then we got married. That same year in '66, so. Oh, because of graduation announcement. Yeah, <laughs> she showed you. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah. And here we are, almost 45 years later, <laughs> still under the same roof. Uh, that's that's quite a, a, a deal with most people these days. Yeah. Well, after your uncle passed on, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with the farm then? Even back before he had passed away, like I say, he had emphysema mm -hmm. <clears throat> and. We were still living in Decatur and then had moved out here shortly thereafter. I had pretty well taken over the daily operation of the farm and was kind of changing it from the type of operation that it was then to what was fitting what we were trying to do here and that we converted everything into row crops and basically at one time had no cattle except during the winter. We graze stalkers on wheat pasture. But we had everything converted over to green beans and butter beans and purple hill peas, wheat, milo, soybeans, and did a lot of double cropping with those commodities. And then like I say, in the wintertime, we'd, or in the fall, we'd plant a, as much as we could to wheat and then bring stalkers in and run stalkers on the wheat pasture through the winter, sell them. We did that for, oh, probably what, 20 years maybe, 22, somewhere along in there. Anyhow, while the kids, especially the two boys, another girl, she didn't get too involved in equipment. In fact, she didn't get too involved in work. <laughs> well, who 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 was harvesting the crops? I did. Okay. Did you have any outside help, or it was just the no, family? No, we just did it ourselves. Okay. Yeah, very once in a while, we like I say, the butter beans and the purple hull peas. A lot of times, still well food. The company that we had on contracted with. If they happened to be close by, they'd come by with their combines and assist us to get it out quick. Now, the green beans, they were contracted with Allen Ken and Company, and they had their own pickers. And they'd come by and do all the picking for the green beans. So that, that was a 60-day crop. You planted normally 20th of April, end of June, the crop was picked, and you could go back and double crop with soybeans or milo if that's what you wanted to do. And like I say, we did that for... Yeah, probably 20 years. And then the boys graduated from high school and started on to college and met their little sweethearts and there went my labor force. <laughs> so we slowly worked our way out of row crops back into strictly cow-calf operation today. And how many head do you have today? There's approximately 200 head of mama cows. We do a spring calving and a fall calving. Who's pulling? Who's what? Pulling calves. I hope nobody. Oh, yeah? We haven't pulled a ah, one this year. Okay. We haven't. We've been lucky. We haven't had a one so far. Good. They've all been by themselves. <laughs> and we've spent an awful lot of time selecting low birth weight bulls. Because mm -hmm. we're, we're, that, that could be kind of that's tough. Oh, well, we've had our share of not good experiences. Yeah. Every once yeah. in a while, we'll have a hiccup. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting now since we try to do it together and we're older. Uh, getting that cow to go down the chute and I get to hold the tail while he's doing his business and sometimes it's not real pleasant <laughs> but we usually manage we don't have to do that very often just once once in a great while does that happen in fact I don't we didn't pull one last fall either hmm. the very last one yeah we the did last just heifer, one. that yeah. one heifer mm -hmm. we had one and it wasn't bad I mean She'd probably have had it if I'd left her alone, but we had other business we wanted to attend to, and she'd been in labor long enough. And That's good. So we just, she was handy. Of course, we keep all of her stuff close to the corrals, and it was easy to put her in and got the calf, and it was alive, and we went on about our business, and Mama went on about her business. <laughs> they ever have any twins? Oh, yes. Every once in a while. I despise twins. I just, well, and I say that last 
I guess it was last fall, I had three sets of twins in this pasture right mm -hmm. out here in front of the house. And I loaded one of them up every time, took them to the sale barn. Mm -hmm. I just do not like a cow raising twins. I mean, you get two knot heads and it takes a lot of work for the cow and she'll go down in production. And next thing you know, she won't cycle on time. And next year you've got a calf that's two or three months late from the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So as valuable as calves are today, just sell the baby calf and let her raise one and go on. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier on her. And when you're going <clears throat> to the sale barn, where is it at today? Where are you going? Here, the last three or four years, I have taken most of my cattle to Decatur. Mm -hmm. They've got a really good sale over there. They've got some good buyers. They've got two owners that are just fantastic gentlemen. They work their sales hard. They're out there to help the customers. They keep good order buyers in and we get as good a price there as anywhere else. And it's close. They come haul them for me and don't charge me to haul them. So we've got a good relationship. Tell me about the structures on the property that have evolved. Any new structures, barns? Okay, from the old home place, when I left it in high school and after college, of course, mom passed away in 92 we made the decision not to rent the house. We did not want anybody in her house. She had probably three generations of history. Five. Five. <laughs> Bad. This house has a big upstairs, and it had all kinds of history in it. Books, of course, photographs, letters. Mom was big in history. Mm -hmm. She never threw anything away. And I could just slap myself <laughs> for not listening to her. And she helped author the Delaware County Historical Society book of Delaware County. And we kid her and pop off, oh, there goes that meeting of the Historical Society, you know. And <laughs> boy, I look back and I just wished I'd listened and paid attention to some of the stories that she could tell because like she was talking about a while ago working on this centennial committee. Man, we're the old timers and we don't remember nothing. That history's gone. So, but yeah, that house, when I left, and like I say, when mom passed away, we elected not to uh, rent it out, so it sat there vacant. Granchy, I'm there three or four times a day doing chores, farm work, whatever. Invariably, somebody is going to think that there's something in there that they need. And we had the house broke into once, and there was nothing there. I mean, my sister and I had already removed the valuables of furniture, precious items, something that meant something to us. And there was just a lot of papers and stuff. But I think the thieves finally realized there was nothing there. So the house was sitting vacant and set vacant for what, five or six years or no, maybe longer? from 92 to 2005. Oh gosh, 13 years. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, in the meantime, our daughter had gotten married. And they lived out west of Jay. Well, they had an opportunity to sell their place. And of course, she's the home ec teacher down here at Siloam Springs. Well, they decided they wanted to move closer, and they had an opportunity to buy 60 acres right here west of us. And then, of course, he's kind of a history nut himself, her husband, and they wanted to move into Mom's old house. I said, oh, fantastic. That just tickled Mom to death. So they remodeled it, added on to it. And of course, the original structure is still there, but we revamped the inside of it and kind of changed the living room, dining room, and kitchen area around and they added on a master bedroom and a master bath and enlarged the kitchen and added on the garage. So that structure, I mean, it's still there, but it's been modernized to kind of fit their needs. The original two barns, the granary and the barn, they're both still there. They're needing some repair. We've added some grain bins back when we were in row crop production. I uh, built a Quonset barn for storage and uh, I've built another hay barn over there, large hay barn. And then we've done an awful lot of conservation work as far as heavy use areas and cross fencing and watering structures and that type of stuff. But uh, it's kind of changed the appearance of the place. Built some corrals on it and modernized it to kind of fit our needs today. But the original place is still there. Any interaction with county agents? <laughs> what are your thoughts about county agents? County agents are great if you had one. 
he he deals with Benton County more than Delaware County. Really, he's oh, yeah. uh, in the uh, hay and forage program through Benton County. The Bermuda grass they have a big uh, contest every year about who's got the best hay and. And it just, you know, encourages people to come together and, and share ideas and, and be good at what they do, you know, quali- high quality hay, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, Arkansas's just always been, you know, the place that he's done a lot of that stuff with, hmm. even though we're in Delaware County. Now, you know, Mike, go back and say our grassroots actually started in Decatur, because that's where we started when mm-hmm. we first got married. That was kind of one of our first places to settle and she went to work there at the poultry <coughs> company, Peterson's, and I was teaching there. And of course, got associated with all the county folks and interactivity with everything that was going on there. And it seems like a lot of their farming practices and a lot of their university uh, bulletins, uh, studies and research is more conductive to this area, mm-hmm. more relevant to the type practices that we have here. And now here in Delaware County, of course, it seems like I don't know, we just get brand new agents. We don't get anybody that's experienced. And all they know is what they get from an OSU fact sheet. Right. And most of those are from the red country or the sand country or somewhere that's not relevant to what we do here. So, therefore, we're just not able to interact with them very much. Like I said, we just do most of our work with the University of Arkansas. Well, again, I mean, you're in a very different geographic region. True. I mean, Oklahoma is very diverse geographically, so uh, it, it seems to make sense that you would have more interaction with other states at this point than, than mm-hmm. just Oklahoma. And But then on the same token, and I've served on the uh, Delaware County Conservation Board for a number of years, implementing conservation practices, you know, for the watershed and for the area that we're in. And it's probably you're well of, aware of because of this being such a poultry side of the state. City of Tulsa, you know, had their lawsuit against our poultry companies back in 91 or 2, somewhere along in there. And uh, all this legislation started coming down about how we have to operate our farms and litter management plans and waste management plans and as an EPA project, and I guess through the Oklahoma Conservation Commission, they decided to set up a uh, study program called the Demonstration Educational Demonstration Project, called the Beatty Creek Water Project. And this was a project between Delaware County, Oklahoma, Benton County, Arkansas, and EPA Region 6 out of Dallas and Fort Worth area. And I chaired that thing for five years. And that's where we ended up putting a lot of these conservation practices into place, not only on our farm, but on practically every farm within the two counties that was in the Beatty Creek watershed. So we have a lot of involvement with Delaware County, but just not necessarily the extension agent. Right. That's interesting because, you know, not not every farmer, rancher uh, likes the extension agent for various reasons or... or (laughs) Uh, it could be it could be many things. So mm-hmm. it's interesting to hear your take on it. Well, it's not that I, you know, I don't have anything against our mm-hmm. agent, and we've had four different county agents since I've been heavily involved in farming. And they're just not any of them have information that's relevant to what we're doing here. Right. But I spend an awful lot of time on the phone and visiting with the Arkansas agent. I mean, Robert C is so relevant to what we're doing and so knowledgeable about the programs that we're running and the type of things that we're doing coincides with what the U of A is doing. Mm-hmm. So that's where we share our information. Sure. And you also have poultry on this, this farm too, oh, right? Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And and tell me about that operation. Oh. How long have you had poultry on the farm? Okay, we built our first two and we raised pullets. Uh, and we built our first two houses in 85 for Peterson Farms out of Decatur liked it so well that it was an opportunity for both of us to get to stay home. I mean, the chicken deal has really been a blessing to us, even though it's had some headaches as we go along through laws, rules, regulations. Mm-hmm. But it's that way with any job. And then it was in 91 when we mm-hmm. built the other. We built two more houses on a 110-acre farm that we had purchased a few years back. And uh, 
we tried to run all four houses by ourselves. Plus, we had built two hog houses, confinement hog houses in 78. And that, with the diversified farming of the cattle and the hay, and we pretty well had our hands full. Mm -hmm. And we don't use hard help. I mean, it's just strictly the family farming operation. Well, our oldest son, by now, has graduated from college, and he's gone to work for Peterson's as a breeder manager in the poultry department. And our youngest son had gotten married, and him and his wife were going to school, also at the University of Arkansas. And uh, they had decided that uh, we want to branch out a little bit. They wanted to buy part of the farm. So we leased them the two houses on that 110 acres that we had purchased a few years earlier, and they just fell in love with it. So they ended up buying it. So now they have two of the houses on that 110 acres, and the wife stays home with the kids, and she raises the pullets, and our son runs the bank at the Bank of Siloam Springs, which is a branch of the Decatur State Bank. So we've still got it all right here in the family. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a, a very poultry-heavy part of Oklahoma. Oh, yes. Very much so. <clears throat> you know, and we haven't really done... I guess this is the third farm in this kind of region, and two of the three have poultry operations. Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, it's different in the central part of Oklahoma. Oh, sure. You just Very much so. Oh, no, no. Yeah, they're begging for our litter, and that's about it. But yeah, yeah the eastern quadrant, the eastern quarter of uh -huh. Oklahoma is heavily, heavily poultry. And then the further south you get, the more concentrated it gets. Mm -hmm. I was going to uh, say something about the continuing of education within the family because when our daughter was in high school, she was thinking about going into, I think, physical therapy or something, and I don't know why. But anyway, uh, we got to talking, and I said, do you realize, I said that uh, there have been like five generations of teachers in your daddy's family, and of course his sister, she had already had her children grown by then, and neither one of them were teachers. One, uh, Randy taught for like one year, and then he became a doctor, and her daughter uh, is in the funeral home and crematory business. Hmm. And so I, I said to Mary, I said, the teaching lineage is going to die out. I said, if somebody doesn't teach within this family unit, oh, okay. So she thought about it, and she so that's what, when she went to university, she decided she was going to be a, they call it family and consumer sciences now, uh, a teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what she does over in, in Siloam Springs. So we've got a continuation there now. I don't know if it will continue that way or not, but that's kind of a, you know, a, that many years of, of people teaching within a family and it, it continuing on is an unusual thing. Usually that doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when your mother was teaching... I mean, it was hard times in Oklahoma with depression. And uh, did she ever have trouble uh, cashing her paycheck, her warrant? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. But you know, she started out teaching up here in a little. Bit. Well, actually, she was in high school when she first started teaching. Yeah. And uh, at the little rural schools. Okay. And then she taught it up here at uh, Yergin. Did she teach some at Ward also? Yes, she uh, taught, taught at several, years. several Twain schools. Years. Yeah. Yeah. What was her topic? What she teach subjects? Elementary education, but of course in the little one room schools you taught everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you taught math, history, science, language, a lot of reading and writing back then. <laughs> was she ever a member of a, a home ec club, home demonstration club? Delta Kappa Gamma. Sorority. Teacher sorority. sorority was mm -hmm. Okay. And 4-H, she was a 4-H leader. leader was her mm -hmm. passion. She loved to write speeches and demonstrations and timely topics and dress reviews. And I got so sick and tired of them dress reviews because <laughs> I'd have to put on slacks and black shoes and polish them and black socks. And I thought, if I ever get out of the dress reviews, I'm doing something different. But Mom was big in that. Did she belong to a homemaker club? Yes. Home uh -huh. homemaker club. Yes, home extension agent. Yes. Yeah, she was pretty active in that that type of activity, that in her church. She was extremely active in the church. Did she sew a quilt? Oh, yeah. She yeah. sewed, yeah. Tremendous amount of sewing. She made uh, Carol's wedding dress and the bridesmaid's dresses for her daughter's wedding. She made all of that. 
on top of all of her teaching and everything because she never, you know, you, you couldn't afford to take out off, so you just did it all. Tremendous amount of crocheting. <clears throat> yeah. We used to laugh at her. <clears throat> she'd take bread wrappers. I mean, she grew up through the Depression, so, and she'd take bread wrappers and crochet rugs. Made rag rugs out of, <laughs> out of the plastic. plastic. rugs out of the plastic bread wrappers. Of course, her flower sacks, you know, they saved their flower sacks and made their shirts and Mm -hmm. We got through making shirts, and she'd make something else out of it. Yeah. Whenever, <laughs> whenever she passed away, I found it, that's, and I've got it in the other room. A round wooden box full of uh, quilt pieces that had already been started. The the Dresden plate. Uh, there's enough there for two quilt tops, and this fabric looks to be like from the tens, twenties, thirties. It's the really old, ugly, yucky looking fabric, but they were already all hand sewn together. These plates were. So I just took them out and washed them very carefully, you know, by hand and laid them out and let them dry. And so now I'm putting those on muslin and someday I'm going to have two quilt tops done out of this stuff that was left. Uh, a lot of a lot of histories there. We don't know for sure if she's the one that put them together or maybe her mother put them together. We don't, we don't really know. Because her mother died probably in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was just 50-something when she mm -hmm. passed. And really don't know what her ailment was, but uh, she was very young when she passed away. So, and this one, believe it or not, she's carried it on. And she's Quilting. made a quilt for every kid and every grandchild. Yeah, yeah. They've got their own special quilt. That... Yeah, and I've got a room full of fabric upstairs, and I've told some of my quilting buddies, I said, you know, whenever I die, you might want to get to the house before David sees what's upstairs <laughs> and go ahead and do something with all that. He's going to wonder. What the world was she thinking? <laughs> it's an addiction. It really is. You buy, you find this fabric. Oh, I think I could make something out of this. So I think I better buy some. So you buy some and you got it. <laughs> well, my daughter felt so bad for me last summer. She said, Dad, if you'll back the truck up to the window while Mom's gone, <laughs> we haul two loads of stuff off and she never missed it. Oh, well. Uh, but his mother had accumulated a whole room, a whole bedroom was uh, full of fabric. And uh, she had put them by fabric types and colors. So she had it on her mind that whenever she retired, whenever she got too old to do anything else, which she never did because she kept having garden and chickens right up to the very end, she was going to make quilts. And you could tell that was what her intent was with all that fabric. So whenever we went into the house in 2004 and 2005 and decided, you know, it's time we did something with this, um, I sorted through a lot of that fabric and I kept a lot of it. A lot of it I didn't keep, and I felt bad about it ever since. You just don't ever throw anything away, but I threw some of that fabric away thinking, you know, it's not something I would probably ever use. I could go ahead and keep it. Then whenever I die, my kids can throw it away. And a lot of things we have kept, we know that's what's going to happen to it because this bookcase over here came from over there, and it's full of family Bibles and uh, textbooks, stuff they use to teach with and all that kind of thing. And... They said, what are you going to do with all that stuff? I said, well, that's your problem. I said, whenever we die, you can do something with it. I don't know. Well, even in the upstairs, we found a little diary that I guess my dad had kept. <clears throat> Every day, he would put a journal entry in there as to what he had done. Hmm. I went to work. I spent 10 cents on... More paper. Yeah. And detailed for like two years. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you about record keeping, how records were kept. Well, they kept everything in the notebook, and it was very, very detailed. Of course, we've got a lot of them here. And we've got a, a lot of ledgers where they kept, they wrote down everything they did, you know, wh where they spent their money. And mm -hmm. uh, at one point in time, it would have been uh, that, I don't know if it's her or her mother. It was her mother. No, maybe it was her. Anyway, uh, she was... Uh, like executor over her brother because the, the mother had already passed and she had to put down everything that she spent on him or for his living or his schooling or his clothing or whatever and I guess make accounting of it to somebody and we have those kind of books and records and we even found one paper that uh, whenever they built the barn how much it cost to build a barn over there so they were savers and keepers never threw cancel checks away never threw check stubs away IRS would never have an issue with them because they had everything documented to the last penny. I spent a penny on nails and I spent two cents on milk or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything was documented. And today is, 
are you using more computer to keep mm -hmm. track of everything with the farm? Or? Yeah, she yeah. does all the yeah, computer I, work. I do uh, keep up our stuff on QuickBooks. Okay. So, yeah. So gone are the days of writing it down in a ledger book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One thing I have to remember is that debit card receipt had better come home. Yeah, so we can write it down the checkbook so I can go ahead and do what I need to do. You write very mm -hmm. few checks. Yeah, yeah. Is it hard to sustain a living just being farmers today? Oh, I don't think it's hard. Of course, you know, we're kind of fortunate in that we've been out of debt for a number of years. But, yeah, if I was heavily leveraged with equipment debt or poultry house debt or vehicle debt, uh, commodity prices on the farm today, as everybody well knows, is fairly good. Cattle prices are good. Wheat prices are good. Corn prices are good. But when you turn around and look at your expendable expenses, fuel is twice what it was last year. Fertilizer is three times as high as it was last year. Equipment is absolutely out the ceiling. So if you were heavily leveraged, I think you'd have a very difficult time making it today. We are not bragging. We just feel very fortunate that we're debt free. Mm -hmm. We try not to stumble anywhere. Try to keep our eggs in a whole bunch of different baskets. To have, so if something happened with the chickens or something happened with the hogs, something happened with the cattle, you've got something else to bank on. And uh, we have slowed down, believe it or not. My kids finally have admitted that I've slowed down. <laughs> and we enjoy running around and playing a little bit. I mean, we'll take off for an hour or two in the afternoon and jump on the trike and be down here and come back over there. So, yeah, we've slowed down our lifestyle. But for years, we, good. we both worked off the it's farm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and always had that other income so that we didn't have to take everything from the farm. We could put stuff back in the farm. Uh, that's the only way it ever would be, you know, where it is today because people that started out young trying to live off the farm and make their payments and their living and raise their kids, uh, I don't see how they could do it. I really don't because things are not constant enough or consistent. You never know when, when you're something's a disaster. And uh, his mother was always a big believer in insurance. And I, we always, you know, she's got insurance on everything for everything and everybody. Uh, and we're the same way. We've, we've always... Maintain, you know, if you've got it, you need to have it insured. If you have a disaster, so that you, you know, you can recoup. A lot of people don't operate like that. Uh, they just leave it up to chance, and chance sometimes isn't very favorable. So just, you know, taking life simple and easy and doing what you can do and let the rest of it slide. And just like on the other side of it, we're fortunate in two of our three children are still living right here close to us. Mm -hmm. They all have outside jobs. But they're wanting to be in the farming area too. <clears throat> like I say, one of them's got 60 acres and one of them's got 110 acres with the two pro houses. And we're fortunate in that we can be here during the day that if they need assistance, it's not a problem. Go do it. And that's going to get them a foot, you know, where they can be here someday because if they just had to walk out there and buy a cold turkey, go in debt, the margin's not there. Sadly to say. How has the neighbors changed through the years? Mm. Oh, that has really changed a lot. Used to, you didn't have hardly any neighbors. Vehicle would drive by. You didn't even look to see who it was. You could tell by the sound of the vehicle which neighbor it was. Uh, farms have sold. Uh, they've divided. We've gotten quite a few new neighbors that's moved in from different areas. Not necessarily are they wanting to farm, they just want a 10 acre ranchette or a 20 acre ranchette. They both, husband and wife work out, kids are home by themselves. On the poultry side of the deal, about six years ago, the Loatian community just absolutely sucked up the chicken houses. A lot of the farmers that were leveraged a little bit, and maybe some banks realized this, maybe some insurance or uh, some real estate agents realized it, and saw an opportunity to sell these farms. And uh, we have a tremendous number of Loatian neighbors now, and of course they're their own community. They've got their own environment, got their own, as 
they call it rules and regulations that they live by. They've got their own little communities. And that's where they don't intermingle with us much. We've got two or three right here close to us that we can visit with on occasion, but it's not not like it used to be. It's not the same. Hmm. Yeah, it's a different community. <clears throat> you know, I'm sure you have regulations that you have to deal with. Do you have any... Um, governmental challenges that that make it hard to continue doing what you do? Oh, yeah. And that's kind of, we referred to it a while ago with the city of Tulsa lawsuit. And <clears throat> because of that, you know, Senate Bill 1170, I guess it was, that was actually passed in whatever that was, 93 maybe. But yeah, that's a set of rules and regulations that we have to live by in our poultry industry. And basically, I mean, they want us to get our education, which that's fine. Nobody's got a problem with that. But their main deal is the uh, application of poultry litter, when and where and the timing and how you can do it and when you can do it. And So to make this thing, I guess, from the government, if you want to say that, or from the court system, we have a team. There's two in Oklahoma and two in Arkansas. that uh, They come out and do all of our soil testing for us in every field. And then if we want to apply poultry litter, whether it be our own litter or litter that we want to purchase, that litter sample has to be correlated with our soil sample. And they've got a computer-generated program where they can tell you, okay, you can put on one ton per acre or you can put on two ton per acre, telling us just exactly what we can put on at what time of the year. They've got two or three different times of the year that they change the rate of application due to water, temperature. And uh, that has caused a lot of unrest I guess for the area because people was, was not accustomed to being told when and how they could clean out and as to how much litter they could apply to this particular field and this caused a lot of issues but people now have kind of gotten adjusted to that and it's kind of worked out to where you just know that that's the rule if you're going to be in the game well that's the rule you play by mm-hmm. and that's probably been one of our biggest challenges okay Has there any ever been a time where you know the farm has really struggled that you you could recall? Our personal farm? Mm-hmm. Oh, you bet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's been a lot of times when this thing was just sitting there teeter tottering, and we were wondering, is there going to be enough to pay Peter or Paul? Which one's <laughs> going to get hungry today? Are the kids going to go hungry, or we're going to make our payment? Sure, we've had our rough times. Mm-hmm. You bet. And can you? Attribute it to anything like the economy or what was going on during that period? The main thing was input costs were high and uh, crop values were low. I mean, the markets were just not where they needed to be. And I mean, you hear that constantly, but, you know, wheat was less than $2 a bushel. Today, it's pushing 9 and 10 mm-hmm. Of course, production costs have gone up today compared to them. But I mean, that's still the thing that was affecting us so drastically was the commodity prices were pretty low and our output or our expenses, it's hard to control some of those expenses. And of course, like what she related to, I mean, I worked two jobs a lot of the times. She had an outside job and a home job, so she had two jobs. But we did that to do what we wanted to do, to have the lifestyle that we wanted. And it's paid off. Mm-hmm. It worked. We're doing it today. Weather has played an issue a lot, too. Time or two. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you get those really hot, dry times, especially whenever we were trying to grow green beans or something like that, because there's, there's such a, you know, a small window of time when they're at their peak. And if they don't get them picked, and of course, you're you're not in control of when they pick them. You're not in control of when they when you plant. So those variables, you know, are taken out for you, and uh, you, you put the seed in the ground, and you take care of it, and, and the harvest is there, and it's ready, but they're not here. And then you get a hot, blowing, dry wind the last of June or the first of July, and the, the beans just shrivel up, and all the weight, the quality, and everything's gone. So those kind of issues, you know, that, uh, and, and your hands are tied, there's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. You can call and say, hey, you need to get over here, but your turn's not here yet. They, just, they work an area, you know, they, they plant different times, different, you know, where it gets warmer down south quicker. They'll plant down there. And come this way. So when it gets time to pick, well, they go down there and come this way. Uh, and if you happen to be, you know, sitting there on a 
crop that you think is just going to be unbelievable and the, the weather uh, throws you a curve or, you know, you may maybe lost it. Well, that's the thing about weather issue. I'll never forget one Christmas. We had a milo crop and had a bunch of acres a milo out. And then in the fall, when it was time, you know, October, November, when it was time to start combining, it started raining. The fields got muddy, the fields got muddier, the fields got muddier, the sun would shine for a day or two, and you'd think, oh, I might get the rain again. Well, then it got to the point that you knew you good and well you weren't going to get a combine on the field until the ground froze. And needless to say, the ground froze the day before Christmas. So you know where we spent Christmas. The boys was in the trucks hauling the grain to the bin, and I was in the combine combining, and they were not... Uh, real satisfied that Santa Claus was not in their truck. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you got to do on the schedule that you got to do. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it thawed out. And if we hadn't got it at the time, we'd have lost that crop. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to have that crop. And it was very important. But they had their Christmas. <laughs> Just a couple of days late. Because <laughs> well, that was a 24-hour day job right there. You're at the mercy of Mother Nature. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Yep. Uh -huh. Got to do what you got to do to make it work. Well, it seems that the farm is very important in your family and it's always played a big role in your lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, why stay on the farm? Why Why even bother? Why is it important for you? Why would you want to do anything else? <laughs> we've discussed oh, this at length. I, I yeah. said, you know, we could, we could sell everything we've got. And be happy for 10 minutes. Buy a beautiful house on the lake and just, you know, take life easy. He said, I'd be bored 15 minutes. And he said, I couldn't stand it. The guy has something to do. <laughs> we can take the pontoon boat and go to the lake on a Sunday afternoon and drive around and look at them big old houses up there on the lake, and she'll say, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, you bet. For about 15 minutes. <laughs> and I would absolutely be sick of that. She yeah. would, too. She don't want it. Well, she could make it better than I could. But yeah. <laughs> no, I'll be right here when I die. How early do you get up today? What was it for? I woke up four o'clock this morning. Four or four thirty is usually when we wake up and start watching yeah. the news and weather and drink drink a coffee. cup of coffee and roll back over <laughs> and, and sleep and a little more. Watch a little bit of news and weather. We're a little snooze, for, <laughs> but no, we're on the ground by five thirty for sure. Well, what do you see happening to the farm, the land, in the next one hundred years? Oh, I'd be a millionaire if I knew that answer. <laughs> Technology, we probably won't even recognize the way that we do things today. I mean, I think technology is just probably hasn't even touched the surface. And to give you a good example that my son, where he bought the other two chicken houses from us, they did what's called an update program. The company offers an update. If you want to do a different type deal, they'll pay you a certain amount of money, blah, 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 to do it. And, uh, of course, we're old. We're retired. I'm not going to go in debt for a chicken house or to do an update or any of this stuff. We're going to stay on the system and our, our houses are computerized. But uh, he elected to do the update program. Wow. I thought ours was modern. They've got such a computer generated program over there. I mean, it tells exactly when to feed how much to feed, when the lights come on, when the water comes on, what the temperature is going to be, which fan runs first, which fan runs second, which fan needs to be in cycle with the next fan so that you've got even wear, uniform heat, uniform coolness throughout the house. I mean, that thing is as modern as you could ever imagine. Six-year-old could run that operation as long as the computer works. <laughs> That's right. As long as the computer works. And what happens when the power goes out? We've got a generator oh. for a backup. That's not always the answer either. And I'll give you an example. 911, I was out doing chores. Heard it on the radio. Airplanes hitting the Twin Towers. So I come flying back to the house and I told her, I said, turn the TV on. I can't believe what I'm hearing is true. Well, sure enough, there's the airplanes, you know, flying into the towers. And we're sitting here just glued to the TV. Well, I've got alarm systems on these two houses and my son's two houses that comes back through an answering machine. We're sitting there watching that stuff, and all of a sudden, the lights go out in our house. TV goes off. And I just instantly froze. I thought, 
they bombed the dam over here at Disney because that's our power source for mm -hmm. REC Electric Company. About that time of the dark, the alarms went off. Phone dollar went off. They're out of power. So I jumped in the pickup, told the wife, I said, you run over and watch these two houses. I'm going to go over and check with their antenna and make sure things are okay. Well, when I turned the corner, my generator had fired. I could hear it running. Got over to her place and their generator was running, her fans are running, everything's going just perfect. I sat there and visited with her for a few minutes and I thought, eh, I don't know, I might need to get back to the house. Come back over here, she's over here dropping our curtains, letting them down. The generator's running, but don't have the fan running. Well, the motor was running, but the generator didn't transfer the little switch. There's a $5 motor that makes the electrical transfer from the generator or from the motor to the generator to make the house hot with electricity. Hmm. So I had to take the manual crank and crank it over. Everything went to working perfect. Just because you got a generator doesn't mean it's always going to work. Hmm. Sounds like you have to be mechanically minded too. Oh, a little bit. And I'm not this real mechanically inclined, but electricity is a bad. It's, you know, flip switch, it better work. <laughs> But yeah, got to have a backup. Mm -hmm. Always. Gosh, well. So do you hope in the future that the land and the farms will, will continue on in the family? Oh, you bet. Yeah, that, that's an ultimate goal and not so much what we have accumulated ourselves. What I've told the kids, I said, I really don't care what you do with my stuff once I'm gone. Y'all do whatever you feel comfortable doing. But some way, somehow, try to preserve the original home place. I mean, I'd like to see it go, like the kids that are there right now, the grandkids, that's the eighth generation. Mm -hmm. And I know there's one, if not two, that's going to be extremely interested in yeah. staying there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's only eight years old. It's already in his blood. Oh, it's in his blood, big time. Now, some of the others, they've kind of gone their separate ways and done their separate things. I mean, we've got one getting ready to go to Afghanistan in June. Uh, he'll never want to be a farmer. He'll never want to come back to the land. Mm -hmm. Trent, the next one, you never know about him. He could possibly. Someday he could possibly, but he's not lived right here close as he was growing up, but he likes what goes on here. But, you know, I, I'm not going to tell him what to do, but... They know our wishes. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> well, do you have anything else you'd like to tell us that we haven't asked you about today? <laughs> Any home remedies? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> you got one. What? <laughs> what? The truck. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We're enjoying our retirement. We take little mini vacations, an hour or two hours at a time. We go jump on the Honda Goldwing trike that we got like two years ago. And uh, that's really been a blessing to us because the way we're tied down here, it is hard to hire anybody to come in that knows how to do the things the way you want them done, to take care of the chickens and the cattle. There's two different times of the year they're calving. You can't go off and leave them in. Uh, you don't want to go off and leave your, your birds and stuff while you know it's really, really hot don't want to go do anything when it's really, really cold. So it's just select times when you could actually go take off and take a vacation. Uh, we've been on a couple of cruises back in the 90s. Uh, and they're great. But, you know, uh, by the time we've been home, away from home for two or three days, we're ready to come home anyway. So mm -hmm. our, our just being able to get away for a few minutes. And that's that's how we spend our leisure time. And spend a lot, of course, church activities and stuff like that. And we started square dancing again. Uh, we did that 30 years ago and gave it up and then take it up again within the last two years. And we go are in a club and we go square dance some and stay active. That way we, you know, have something to do besides fall asleep in front of the TV every night. <laughs> well, I think the track has probably been the biggest thing that we have really enjoyed. Yeah, Everybody it is. Everybody that knows us. There's not a one of them that can believe it. When we first <laughs> bought it, you would be the last person in the world that I ever thought would be on a track. But we just love it. That is good. Absolutely. You know, late in the afternoon, especially in the summertime when it's hot, but late in the afternoon after we know that the curtains are okay on the chickens, the fans are running, and we've got our backups in place, we'll jump on it, maybe run the side on and get an ice cream cone or 
run to Grove and eat a quick supper and come back. And, but uh, yeah, we have really enjoyed that. Yeah. It's kind of been a relaxation and slowed down a little bit. And everything looks different. The countryside looks different when you're on the back of a bike. <laughs> Everything's greener and prettier. <laughs> she falls asleep on it. Yeah, I do. Do you really? Yes, I do. Yes. yes. I pulled up to a stop sign over here one day and I said, hey, are we supposed to turn left or right? And I felt it kind of shake. <laughs> She's asleep. <laughs> asleep at the switch. <laughs> yes. It's a good thing she's not driving. I was it? about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how you know she's relaxed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I got a tickle letter here. What was last Thursday? I was over painting the fence at the cemetery and trying to get it finished up. The wind was blowing. So I quit. It got a little bit cool, too. Of course, the spray paint was getting all over me, so it was a good time to quit. Come back in the house, and she was sitting there and said, Oh, I sure would like to go mow. I said, It's just too cold to be out there on that lawnmower. Oh, because I had bright ideas. I wanted to go to Tahlequah and go up and down the Illinois River and see what the flood had done. I said, Babe, I think I'm going to take a trot and go to Tahlequah. Well, that old lady jumped up off that couch, <laughs> grabbed her letters before I could even get turned around. I said, you mean it's not too cold to ride, but it's too cold to mow? Oh, yeah, yeah it's, it is with me a problem. <laughs> well, I, I actually wanted to ask you about the cemetery. Uh, your your family's all buried in the same cemetery yes. close by, is that, is yes, that right? It's just right over here. It's the Ward Cemetery, and there's probably six generations in there now, six or seven. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, uh, we lost a two-year-old granddaughter last summer. And uh, that's when we really started taking an interest in getting the cemetery back up to, you know, a good a good thing. Because it had kind of, no one had really taken an interest and done that much and stuff. And so they, they came in and had done some new fencing and cleared up a bunch of old brush and stuff. And so we're, tr we're trying to make it better than what it was. You know? Well, that's good. But, yeah, there's... It's, all the way back to uh, the Johnson Thompson. We I don't know where he is buried, but the rest of them. yeah, but the James Franklin on down, they're all over there, and so it's it's quite a deal to be able to go and look at those those tombstones with all those people's names and stuff on them. Here again, that was one another one of Mother's activities. She somehow got elected the secretary of the cemetery association, quote, quote, whatever that was, because it was no such thing. It was just she got elected to do it. So you know who got to mow it in the summertime. You did. Well, I had a neighbor, he and I. And of course, back then you didn't have lawnmowers that mounted anything, and we'd mow it like twice a year. My gosh, it might get up there three and a half, four foot tall and take those old brush cutters and push and it would take us three or four days to get it mowed. And it's not a very big cemetery. And of course today you can mow it in a couple of hours with riding lawnmowers like yeah. we have. But yeah, through the years it had just for some reason kind of fallen on our family to take care of it. Looks like it's really getting ready to now. Yeah. A storm blew through there in probably 70... One or oh, seventy-two. Yeah, it had big, beautiful uh, cedar trees and huge cedar trees. Just phenomenal. And a storm blew through it, like a little twister tornado type thing. Tore a bunch of those trees up. Tore a bunch of the tombstones up. You know, laid them over where you couldn't even tell where they were supposed to be. So him and his uncle went in and, and cleaned those trees up, cut them up, uh, made lumber out of it, and we just kind of sat on that lumber for years and years and years and. He had built a couple of cedar chests and a toy chest and stuff and gun cabinet, things for us here personally. And whenever they got ready to redo the house over there, Our daughter, uh, and son -in -law. He, he took that cedar lumber and made their kitchen cabinets out of it. So, you know, we, we try not to waste anything. And there was a big walnut tree in the front yard that uh, blew over. Wind blowed it over. And so they've taken a lot of the lumber from that walnut tree and made furniture and stuff. And it's there in the house. We've tried to, a lot of the stuff that we took out of the house originally to keep people from stealing it, we've taken it back and put it in the house now. So she's got a lot of the uh, original uh, things that really belong in the house. She has, has them over there using them. So trying to, you know, keep things where they need to be, mm -hmm. keep it all together. So yeah. everything's got, a, got history to it. Well, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to meet well, with us. Neat. And we appreciate it so much.